In this video tutorial, we will introduce the topics of empirical and molecular formulae, as well as hydrates. The empirical formula, also known as the simplest formula, shows the lowest whole number ratio of the elements in a compound. Looking at glucose, its molecular formula, or its actual formula, is C6H12O6. So in the actual chemical formula for glucose, there are 6 carbons, 12 hydrogens, and 6 oxygens. However, its empirical formula, its simplest formula with the lowest ratio, is C1H2O1, meaning that there are twice as many hydrogens as there are carbons and oxygens. So the lowest ratio of elements is a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So what I want you to do is press pause and reduce these molecular formulae to their empirical formula, the lowest ratios for each of these chemical compounds. When you're ready, press play and we'll take it up. All right, so the empirical formula for benzene, when you reduce this to the lowest ratio, is CH with a 1 to 1 ratio between carbon and hydrogen. With ethine, it'd be C2H2 turns into a CH for the empirical formula, with again, the ratio is 1 to 1. Whereas aniline, C6H7N, you can't reduce these ratios any further. So the lowest ratio is C, uh, 6 to 7 to 1, where the empirical formula, C6H7N, is the same as the molecular formula. So you can have situations where the molecular formula is also the empirical formula. So let's try this again. Based on the molecular formula for these different substances, please provide me with the empirical formula and the lowest ratio of elements. Press pause. When you're ready, press play, and we'll take it up. All right, so as you can see, the empirical formula for all four substances is identical. They all have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio between carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So while their molecular formulas are all different and unique, their empirical formulas are identical. So this is where students start to ask, why? What's the point of the empirical formula if it doesn't provide much of a benefit? It's the molecular formula that is more important. The molecular formula that determines the identity of the substance itself. It provides us with more information, so why do we bother with the empirical formula? That's because sometimes that's all you have. I hate CSI. It is, it is exactly what this emoji says. Unfortunately, it gives people an unreasonable expectation of science. If you've ever watched an episode of CSI before, you'll see that they'll take this real grainy footage and then suddenly enhance it and they've got the actual license plate number. It's messed up. Totally unrealistic. I remember watching one episode where they were trying to identify a mystery substance. They placed a sample into a magical computer, pushed a button, beep beep boop boop boop, and suddenly it outputted the molecular structure of the mystery compound. And then Google Maps popped out and showed you exactly where you can find that mystery substance. Absolute crap. Absolute fiction does not exist. That's just not how things work in reality. Real crime scene investigators and technicians hate going to court to testify uh, in front of juries because the jury who watches CSI has an unreasonable expectation of what the science can bring, what the science can do. And they're constantly having to try to explain to these juries that what they see on TV doesn't actually exist. So, if there is no magical machine to help you identify mystery substance, how does it work in reality? Well, we use a variety of different techniques and equipment, one of which is called an atomic spectrometer. It will essentially take an unknown substance and then atomize it, meaning it will be ripping apart the molecule into its individual component atoms. These pieces, these fragments, parts of the mystery molecule, are then sent through a filament where they are uh, ionized and charged up. As they accelerate forward, they are then exposed to a magnetic field. The pieces that have very little charge aren't really affected by the magnetic field too much, and so they don't get much of a deflection, and they end up just going straight through and hitting an analyzer, a detector. Whereas the pieces that are very charged are really affected by this magnetic field, and they really get deflected quite a bit. Depending on where they land on the detector, we can analyze that information and determine the identity of that element. So that information can then be given to us as a percentage composition of our mystery substance. So let's pretend this is my mystery substance. Its molecular formula is R4B2Y2. Four reds, two blues, two yellows. But I don't know this information. Now, in my mystery sample, I have 6.02 times 10 to the power 23 of these little molecules. To help me determine what is inside my mystery substance, what is it made up of, I put it through my mass spectrometer. In the mass spectrometer, it puts it through the atomizer, which then rips it apart into atoms. From there, I can analyze the individual components and realize, oh, it's made up of reds, blues, and yellows. But more importantly, I know the ratio of reds to blues to yellows. 
I don't know how they were originally assembled, so I don't know if it was like a 4 to 2 to 2 ratio or a 6 to 3 to 3 ratio, but I do know the lowest ratio of elements involved are 2 to 1 to 1. It's like, let's say I have a bag of chocolate chip cookies, all right? But then my friend sits on it, and now they've all been crushed. From the remains, I can tell that it was a chocolate chip cookie, but I can't tell how many cookies there were at the start. Was it one giant cookie, four regular-sized cookies, maybe 16 mini cookies? Well, that's the same issue we have with the atomic spectrometer. We know the basic composition of the compound, the empirical formula, but we don't know exactly what it originally looked like, so we don't know its molecular formula. But that is where we begin. It is our job as a lab tech, with our chemistry knowledge, to conduct numerous experiments to determine which ratio is the molecular formula, the actual formula. So we now have a starting point, essentially. We might not know what is the actual molecular formula, but now we have a list of potential candidates. So if the ratio was 2 to 1 to 1, the actual formula could have been 4 to 2 to 2, or 6 to 3 to 3. Can you come up with another possibility? This feels like a kid's show. But that's right! It could be 8 to 4 to 4! So, to recap, we need the empirical formula because sometimes that's all we're given, the lowest ratio of elements in their percent compositions. From this information, we can conduct further experiments to determine which of these falling potential molecular formulas is the actual molecular formula. Alright, so how do we determine the empirical formula? Four easy steps. First, you're going to convert your percentage values into a mass. From there, turn your mass values into mole values. Then you're going to divide by the smallest mole value, and if necessary, multiply whole. I know this doesn't make sense to you right now, but when we go through a sample calculation, it'll make a lot more sense. Uh, but if you repeat this enough times, it actually starts to grow on you. Percent to mass, mass to mole, divide by small, multiply whole. Percent to mass, mass to mole, divide by small, multiply whole. Percent to mass, you get the idea. All right, here we go. So if we place this mystery sample into our uh, spectrometer. It has ripped it apart, and we've determined that the empirical formula, the starting point of a compound, is 85.6% carbon, and 14.4% hydrogen. So how do we do the first step, converting these percentages into mass values? Well, we're going to assume a 100 gram sample. Now, you don't have to choose a 100 gram sample, you can choose any size sample you want. I just chose 100 grams because it now makes it easier. If you have a 100 gram sample, and 85.6% of it is carbon, then the mass of carbon is 85.6 grams, while the mass of the hydrogen is 14.4 grams. Remember, according to the law of definite proportions, it doesn't matter how big or small your sample size is, these percentages don't change. As long as it's the same substance, it's always going to be 85.6% carbon, always 14.4% carbon. Whether you have a 100 gram sample or a 2 billion gram sample, these percentages do not change. Alright, so we've done the first step, percent to mass. Now we need to convert our mass values into mole values. Whoops, I just realized I wrote the wrong title. It's not mass to mole. That's the second step. It's actually percent to mass. Whoops. All right, now we can do mass to mole. So, if you recall, in order to calculate moles, the equation is mole is equal to mass divided by the molar mass. The mass value of carbon we got was 85.6 grams. The molar mass of carbon we can get from the periodic table, 12.01 grams per mole. And when we divide the two, we get 7.12739 dot dot dot. It just goes on forever. Uh, now, when it comes to these uh, calculations, please keep at least five or six significant figures. Do not round until you get to the final answer. All right, so typically your final answer will have usually three sig figs. Uh, but when you're doing the calculations, keep as many of the sig figs as you can. Usually five or six is recommended. And only round when we get to the final answer. Otherwise, your rounding issues will start to magnify the problems as you go down the calculations. All right, so in our 100 gram sample, we now have 7.12 moles of carbon. So the mole of hydrogen is equal to mass of the hydrogen divided by the molar mass of the hydrogen. Mass of the hydrogen, as we saw, is 14.4 grams. The molar mass of hydrogen we get from the periodic table, which is 1.01 grams per mole. And we finally get 14.2574 moles of hydrogen in our 100 gram sample. Now, after a while, these calculations on your page will start to get messy. So my recommendation is to block off your answers over here. That way you're not wasting your time on a test trying to find these values. All right, so onwards to step three, divide by small. So what we do here is divide all these mole values by the smallest mole value. Since carbon is the smallest mole value of them both, I will divide every one of these ones by 7.127. So carbon, 7.12, dot, 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 divide by 7.12, dot, 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 that equals to one. 
hydrogen 14.2 dot 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 divided by 7.12 dot 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 that gives me about 2.0036 but we can round that to a 2. Now because everything worked out well nice whole numbers there are no weird fractions we don't require step 4 multiply whole. I'll show you a step or a question later on where we do need this one but for this specific question step 4 is unnecessary. So based on these calculations, I now know that there are one carbon and two hydrogens in my empirical formula. So my empirical formula is CH2. And my molecular formula could be C2H4 or C3H6, C4H8, C5H10, so many possibilities. As long as their basic ratio is CH2, I now have a list of potential molecular formulas that I can do further experimentations to determine and eliminate which ones are most likely to be my uh, compound. Now, students are typically okay with the first step, percent to mass. That's okay, that makes sense. Assume a 100 gram sample, convert this into mass value. Students are usually okay with this step as well, mass turning to moles, because, well, in chemistry, the mole is very, very important to us. It is the starting point for most calculations, so why not convert to moles? But they tend to be confused about what the purpose is behind divide by small. Why do we divide by small? Well, let's take a look at this example. I have 24 campers and I have three camp counselors. So how many campers do I give each camp counselor? I hope the answer you got was 8 each. So 8 campers for each camp counselor. But how did you arrive at that value? You divided by small. You took the bigger number, divided by the smaller number, so 24 campers divided by 3 camp, uh, counselors, and you got 8 campers per camp counselor, 8 each. Well, that's the same thing you did over here, except instead of camp counselors and children, we're looking at carbons and hydrogens. If you want to be fair, you can't have one camp counselor having all the kids and the other two are just doing nothing. The groups should be evenly distributed. Well, same thing over here. These percentages are set. You cannot change these values. So you can't have one molecule with more carbons than another molecule. You can't have one molecule with more hydrogens than another molecule. They should all have the same chemical formula because they all should have the same percentage composition. So what we did over here, when we said divide by small, we took all these kids, these hydrogens, and divide them equally into all these camp counselors, the carbons, so that each carbon should get the same number of hydrogens as every other carbon in this uh, molecular compound. All right, so that's the purpose of divide by small, to evenly distribute the hydrogen atoms, in this case, into each carbon so they all get the same number of hydrogens. All right, so let's try out this question over here. Using these percentage composition values by mass, I want you to find the empirical formula for this chemical compound. Press pause. When you're ready, press play, and we'll take it up together. All right, so step one, percent to mass. We're going to assume a 100 gram sample. Like I said before, you don't have to choose 100 grams. Maybe you like pain. Choose your phone number. I don't care. You'll still get the same answer in the end. I just choose 100 because now it makes it easier for me. 17.6% of 100. 17.6 grams. 82.4% nitrogen, 82.4 grams. Now let's move on to step two. Since mole is equal to mass divided by the molar mass, then the mole of hydrogen is 17.6 grams, divided by the molar mass of hydrogen, 1.01 grams per mole. Now some students ask, sir, isn't hydrogen diatomic? Shouldn't it be 2.02 grams per mole? We only worry about diatomic hydrogen and diatomic nitrogen if they're by themselves. But they're not by themselves. They are bonded together in a chemical compound. A mystery chemical compound, but a chemical compound. If you made them diatomic and N2H2 together, then what's the whole point of doing any of these calculations? Your answer is N2H2. But that doesn't make sense because we know the percent composition is 70.6% hydrogen and 82.4% nitrogen, and this is not the right percentage. All right, so only factor in N2H2, the diatomic values, if they're by themselves. But for these types of calculations, because they're chemically combined, there's no need for you to worry about the diatomic molar mass values. Just use the regular single hydrogen atom, the regular single nitrogen atom, because they are chemically combined right now. All right, again, keep as many sig figs as you can. Typically, five or six is good enough. And then uh, we, I like to block off my values so that when I'm doing my calculations and looking them over again, I know exactly which values are more important to me so I don't spend time wasting it anyway, looking for the right number. Do the same thing with the nitrogen, 82.4 grams. Divide by the molar mass of nitrogen, 14.01 grams per mole. We can get this value, of course, from the periodic table, just like the 1.01. And we get a 5.88151 dot 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 moles of nitrogen. All right, onwards to step three, divide by small. Since the moles of nitrogen is a smaller value than hydrogen, we're going to divide everybody 
by 5.88. So 17.4 dot 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 divided by 5.8 dot 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 gives me 2.96. That is very close to 3, so I'm going to round it to 3. And of course 5.8 dot 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 divided by 5.8 dot 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 is exactly 1. So in this case, because these values are easily roundable, I don't need to do step 4, multiply whole. That's only done if necessary, which is what we're going to find in our next example. But to finish this question off, the empirical formula is now H3N, so 3 H's, and 1 nitrogen. While the possible molecular formulae are going to be multiples of this, so either H6N2, H9N3, etc, etc. Alright, so when do we do multiply whole? What I want you to do is try to find the empirical formula for this compound, but stop after step 3. Alright, so after step 3, we need to do a step 4. I'll show you how to do that in just a few moments. So press pause, press play when you're ready, and we'll take it up together. All right, so in the interest of time, I kind of combined steps one and two together, percent of mass, then went straight to mass to mole. So if I have a 100 gram sample, I've got 81.7 grams of carbon divided by its molar mass, 12.01 grams per mole, gives me about 6.80266 dot 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 moles of carbon. With hydrogen, same thing, 18.3% turns to 18.3 grams, divided by the molar mass of hydrogen, 1.01 .01 grams per mole, gives me 18.118811 repeating moles of hydrogen. Now, when we divide by small, we run into a problem. So the smallest mole value is carbons, 6.8, while the largest one is hydrogens, 18.11. So divide every one by 6.8, and of course, the number of carbons equals to 1, but number of hydrogens equals 2.66. In our previous examples, it was quite obvious what we would do when we have 2.96. We could round that up to a 3. But with the 2.66, it's much too far to round up or round down. In general, the rules are, if it's some number 0.1 and below, you can round down. If it's some number 0.9 and above, you can round up. So anything less than 0.1, you can round down. That's close enough. Anything 0.9 and above, you can round up. That's close enough. But anything between 0.1 and 0.9 will require you to follow the last step, multiply by whole. So we're going to multiply this equation by whole numbers until we get a number that we can round, up or down. Obviously, multiply by 1 is not going to help you. This number is still too far away to round up or round down. Multiplying by 2 also isn't helpful. You still get C2, that's fine, but then you get H5.32. So when 2.66 is multiplied by 2, you get 5.32. That's still not close enough to round up or round down. But when you multiply by 3, now we get C3, and 3 times 2.66 gives you 7.98. Now this number is close enough to round up, giving me an empirical formula of C3H8. All right. Now, if 3 didn't work, you would just keep going. Keep multiplying by whole numbers until you reach a value that is roundable. But that is also the reason why you must keep as many sig figs as you can. Typically, 5 or 6 sig figs is good. Because if you round too early over here, these numbers get really awkward, and you may not find an answer. I've also found the opposite is true. If you keep too many sig figs, you also get values that are not roundable either. So typically, based on my experience, 5 or 6 sig figs is the sweet spot. Keep those significant figures as you do your calculations. Only round at this final step over here. And only round if you reach these conditions, 0.1 and below or 0.9 and above. Anywhere in between, and you must multiply whole until you get a value that is roundable. All right, so in a previous question that we did, we found that the empirical formula was CH2. That means possible molecular formulae include C2H4, C3H6, and C4H8 because they are multiples of CH2. Well, tell me, how many times heavier is C2H4 than CH2? Well, because it has twice the number of carbons and twice the number of hydrogens, it should be twice as heavy as the empirical formula. The same goes over here, 3 times the number of carbons, 3 times the number of hydrogens, so it should be 3 times as heavy. Well, this one will be 4 times as heavy. So if I gave you additional information and told you that the molecular molar mass is 84.18 grams per mole, you should be able to solve for the molecular formula and identify what the actual molecular formula is. You would first start off by calculating the empirical molar mass. So the molar mass of the empirical formula is one carbon and two hydrogens, so two times 1.01, which gives you 14.03 grams per mole. Then what you want to do is identify how many times bigger is this molecular formula, molar mass, than the empirical formula, molar mass. For this, we divide by small. Take the big number, divided by the small number over here and see how many times bigger, how many times will it fit inside. So 84.18 divided by 14.03 equals 6. Therefore, the molecular molar mass is 6 times larger than the empirical molar mass. As such, we multiply the empirical formula by 6. It's going to have 6 times the number of carbons 
and six times the number of hydrogens, and now we have achieved and discovered our molecular formula. All right, so these questions will always give you enough information to A, calculate the empirical formula, and B, using the empirical formula, determine the molecular formula as well. In this case, they gave you the molecular molar mass, so all you had to do is determine how many times bigger the uh, molecular is than the uh, empirical, and from there, multiply the empirical formula by that magnitude to find your molecular formula. So for our final topic, I don't really have a handout for it. I usually just write this on the chalkboard. It's a pretty short note. But essentially, hydrates are ionic compounds that have a strong affinity, a strong attraction for water molecules. As such, we refer to these compounds as hydrates. So here we have lithium chloride. It is a hydrate. It is attracted to, in this case, four water molecules. That's why we call it lithium chloride tetrahydrate. So the first part, lithium chloride, that's the same nomenclature you're used to. But to show that it's attracted to four water molecules, we say tetrahydrate. Tetra is the Greek prefix for four, so four water molecules are attracted to lithium chloride. Now instead of shoving this into one giant chemical formula, we put a dot here. And this dot represents a strong attraction for water molecules, but it's not a permanent chemical bond. You can easily dehydrate these compounds, so getting rid of the water, just by heating it up. By heating it up, we can remove those water molecules, so it's not a permanent chemical bond, but rather a strong attraction, which is why we put a dot there. Now, if the water is no longer there, if it's missing, we call it anhydrous lithium chloride. All right, so the anhydrous means without the water, it's dried. So when I purchase lithium chloride from the manufacturer, they will ask me, do you want the hydrated version, or do you want the anhydrous version? the one with water or the one without. Usually the one without is a little more expensive because they have to keep it in special dry conditions, otherwise it'll start to grab water molecules from the air, from the humidity in the air. So when we store these chemical compounds, you really have to make sure the lids are tightly capped on these guys, otherwise they will slowly grab water molecules from the humidity in the air, and the next thing you know, instead of a nice dry powder, you've got slush inside that bottle. Wasted chemicals. Such substances we refer to as being hygroscopic, meaning they readily absorb moisture from the air. Hygroscopic. All right, so let's try a sample question involving hydrates. So a 50 gram sample of hydrated barium hydroxide, BaOH2, XH2O, so I don't know how many water molecules are associated with it, but it's placed in an oven and heated. After heating, its mass was then measured to be 27.2 grams. So the question is, how many water molecules are associated with each barium hydroxide? So the original hydrated version weighed 50 grams, while the anhydrous version, so after heating, when the water is all gone, the anhydrate weighs 27.2 grams. So if we subtract these two values, we now have 22.8 grams of missing water. Now here's a little bit of a hint. If you have no clue what to do, convert to moles. That's usually the first step. So the game plan here is to convert this to moles, convert this to moles, and then divide by small to see how many water molecules fit into each barium hydroxide. So if you recall, moles equal to mass divided by molar mass. So mass of barium hydroxide divided by the molar mass of barium hydroxide, 27.2 grams. 171.3 grams per mole we can find from the periodic table gives me a 0 0.159 moles of barium hydroxide. Do the same thing for the water, mass of water, molar mass of water, 22.8 grams. That's what we calculated for the mass of the water. Molar mass of the water is 18.02. We got those from the periodic table. Gives you 1.27 moles of water. From here, we can divide by small. And we get the barium hydroxide, 0.159, divided by 0.159, since it's the smallest number. Gives you a 1. Number of waters, take the 1.27, divide by the smaller one, 0.159, and get 7.98. This number is close enough to round up, so we round it up to an 8. So our formula is barium hydroxide, octahydrate because there are eight water molecules associated with each barium hydroxide. Now a common mistake the students will make is they will over here try to find the mole of barium hydroxide with the water molecules here. No, 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 no. You can only find the mole of barium hydroxide and hydrate, so the dried up version. Because you don't know how many water molecules are attached to this molecule, you can't calculate its molar mass. All right? I can calculate the molar mass of barium hydroxide because everything is known. You can definitely uh, punch that in from the periodic table. But over here, since we don't know how many water molecules are attached, I can't give you the molar mass of this compound. All right? So when you're doing this type of question, don't use the molar mass of this compound, of the hydrated version. 
only use the molar mass of the dehydrated version and the mass of the dehydrated version. And so to recap, we first subtracted these two values to find out what mass of water was evaporated away. From there, we found the mole of the barium hydroxide and the mole of the water molecules. From there, we can then uh, divide by small. And so I can find out how many water molecules fit into each of the barium hydroxides. In this case, 7.98, which we can round up to an 8. So 8 water molecules for every 1 barium hydroxide, resulting in a chemical formula of barium hydroxide, octahydrate. All right, let's do one last question, and I'll set you loose. So here we have another hydrate, zinc chlorate. Dot, I have no clue how many water molecules are associated to, though. What I can tell you is that the zinc makes up 21.5% by mass of the entire compound, including the water. So the question is, solve for x. How many water molecules are associated with each zinc chlorate? All right, press pause. When you're ready, press play, and we'll take it up. All right, so there's a slight trick to this particular question. It's not super difficult. All that's required is just the law of depth of proportions. But once you see how this works, you can apply it to future situations. So first step, I'm going to write out the equation for percent composition of zinc. Because this question doesn't really provide you with any additional mass values, we're going to use the theoretical mass values from the periodic table. So the molar mass of zinc divided by the molar mass of zinc chlorate plus the molar mass of the X number of water molecules then multiply by 100% and you should get this 21.5% by mass. So if I rewrite this equation by filling in the numbers, I get 21.5% is the zinc by mass. Molar mass of zinc I can find for the periodic table, 65.39. Molar mass of the zinc chlorate is 232.29. Again, find that for the periodic table. And here's the trick. The molar mass of one water molecule is 18.02. We can find that from the periodic table. But since I don't know how many water molecules there are, I'm going to say x. x number of 18.02s. And then we just multiply by 100%. And what we're going to do is we're going to solve for this x value. Now, I'm going to convert this percentage into a decimal. So that becomes 0 0.215. And then I'm going to start simplifying this equation. We're going to multiply out the denominator over here. Let's move this up a little bit. So again, multiply it in, 0.215 times the 232.29, and then of course 0.215 times the 18.02x equals the 65.39. I'm going to just clear this up a little bit more. This turns into 49.942, while this one becomes 3.874x, and we're again, no change over here, 65.39. I'm going to collect my like terms, so bring this onto the other side. So 65.39 subtract the 49.942, equals 3.874x, and then of course from here I can just uh, take this 3.874, divide it out on the other side, giving me a 3.98. Now you don't have to show me every single bit of this on a test, I'm just showing every single step in case uh, some of you have difficulties following the algebra. Now once we get 3.98, of course this is close enough for me to round up, and that's what we'll do, and that shows us we have four water molecules. So we have zinc chlorate, tetra, hydrate.